God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you. This past week I've been, as the Bible might say, downtrodden or discouraged in spirit. And like you, I come to worship to hear God's word of hope now and in ages past that encourages us today. And I will tell you that the word we heard today from this letter of Philippians gave me great hope and encouragement for our future, and I hope that our reflection on it now will do the same for you. Please pray with me. Holy God, we give thanks for all the people you have placed in our lives, seeking after their welfare and entrusting their strengths and needs to your love. We pray, Holy One, as we reflect upon your word today, that our love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help us determine what is best so that as we move through this challenging season, we may be pure and blameless in the sight of Jesus Christ. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer through Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Beloved in Christ, I thank my God every time I remember you, every time I think of you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you. Whether you are at home this morning, if you're on the road, if you're up north or out to camp, whether you've worshipped already here at chapel today or even now across the way in C2 or right here in the sanctuary, I thank God every time I think of you and every time I speak about you to one of my colleagues or friends around this country. With these words written from a suffering place in prison, alongside his young colleague, Timothy, Paul opened a letter he wrote to one of the churches that he started in a place called Philippi. And today, with equal love and fervor, I earnestly share them now with you. I bring you this morning great hope in the midst of these very troubled times. We're all in this together. Our future inspiration, vitality, and well-being comes from our unity as the saints of Christ, one body bound together through a deep mutual commitment to love and to care for one another in community. Jesus modeled a deep commitment to connect in community when he called the disciples and traveled and stayed regularly with family and friends. And when Jesus went out alone, it was to reflect and pray in the company of his Father so he could be renewed in spirit for the work that God had called him to do. His time apart always propelled him back into the community of God's beloved gathering together, holding fast to what we believe insofar as it is possible is not only the way of Christ, but as it turns out, also provides the key to life itself. Many of you have looked to me as your leader through what turns out to be some of the most extraordinary of times. We thought that the pandemic was long and challenging, sometimes terrifying, yet God showed us a way through and even brought us joy out of suffering when for a time the wheels stopped turning and we rested. We emerge now maskless and blinking, eager to move on, only to discover that the world we left behind has become increasingly anxious and divided. We deeply lament that our reaction to stress and an uneasy sense of personal impotence to change things leads increasingly to violence, as it did once again this past week. How easy it would have been 
for the leader of those early churches to give up and walk away. The threats against the early church were so overwhelmingly significant. Paul's chronic illness and frequent imprisonments placed heavy odds against our having this conversation this morning. Truly, it is by the grace of God alone that God's truth and light continues to gather us in faith through every suffering season, generation after generation across time. God relentlessly comes after us with any means at hand to restore our broken world to the perfection of open-hearted love and care for one another and all creation as God intends. And this is my prayer, Paul writes, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine in time like these what is best He prayed for the people he loved to experience a harvest of faithful living by following the way of Christ through the very most difficult of times and all to the glory of God. And above all else, he invited them to do it together. Beloved in Christ, that is God's best hope for us that we resist the temptation to withdraw and try to figure out on our own what we imagine the worst problems to be and then energetically defend our perspective on what we think needs to happen to make it right. Tempting as this may be, this path leads to further anxiety and deeper divisions among us. Now as then, no one of us as mortals knows the way through these challenging times, times that are similar to and yet very different than any place we've been before. Together as followers of the way of Christ, by the power of God at work through the Holy Spirit, we can accomplish anything And despite our considerable struggles and sufferings, we can do it with joy. In recent years, a social science columnist for the Wall Street Journal named Susan Parker gave a TED Talk entitled, The Secret to Living Longer May Be Your Social Life. In her research, she discovered that the little Italian island of Sardinia had 10 times as many centenarians per capita, that's people over 100 years of age, as North America. Why? It wasn't the olive oil. (laughs) It wasn't the sunny climate. We've got that here in Florida. It wasn't the gluten-free diet or their personality type. It was the quality of close personal relationships and face-to-face interactions. She concluded her talk this way, building in-person interaction into our cities, into our workplaces, into our play, into our everyday agendas, sends feel-good hormones surging through the bloodstream and brain, and that helps us to live longer. W. David O. Taylor, in his work, The Open and Unafraid, observes that this building of our village and building it and restoring it and sustaining it is a matter of life and death. It's good for our health. It's good for our faith. And it all starts here in our commitment as the saints of God to hold fast to one another with love, mutual respect, and care. Paul couldn't have been more direct in his love letter to the various groups of people in the town of Philippi in northeastern Greece. He wrote to collective groups of people, the saints, the bishops, the deacons, in one of the earliest and most significant of communities committed to following the way of Christ less than 50 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. 
Paul writes this impassioned letter from his prison cell in profound gratitude for their care for him in his time of suffering. Years ago, I went on a Journeys of Paul tour to Greece and across the way to Ephesus. It was a pattern of Paul's second missionary journey. And I visited one of the prisons where Paul was held captive. It was more than a damp fruit cellar dug into the side of a hill with metal bars containing him in this holding cell until local authorities could figure out what in the world to do with him. There was no prison system at that time, in that place. There were no standards for prisoner care, no laws, no water, no food, no exercise yard. His very survival, in fact, any prisoner's survival, depended entirely on the consistent and generous care of a community of people who regularly brought him food and water and comfort in what had to be the most miserable of conditions. And yet, out of Paul's deep suffering, he writes this extraordinary love letter to the people of Philippi who were a bridge between the early church in Jerusalem and the spread of Christianity northward into Europe. So much was at stake in helping them find a way forward through terrible times. Paul writes that he considers his suffering the very occasion to draw community together, which is a central characteristic in Christian life. In our age of individualism and personal entitlement, Paul's appeal to the whole community to bind together out of common love for one another in Christ offers us a powerful antidote to the suffering we're experiencing as we emerge blinking from the loneliness of COVID isolation and the broken world on the other side. Not unlike the experience faced by these early ancient peoples. Theologian Amy Oden reminds us that the Philippians are our ancestors in faith, and what Paul writes to them, he also says to us, for while the specifics of their condition and situation differ from ours, their questions, how to maintain confidence in the face of struggle, the search for peace and contentment in a turbulent world, deeply resonate with our own concerns. For this reason, we keep reading these ancient words, hearing in them the concern of a pastor for the growth and health of a Christian congregation. First, for those believers gathered at Philippi in the middle of the first century, and now for countless communities of faith spread all over our nation and globe in the 21st century. From that first Easter through the birth of the church at Pentecost, which is upon us in just a couple of weeks, God's good news is always communal in character for all who follow the way of Christ. The gospel is no lone ranger enterprise. It's a partnership for all the saints, the whole church. Now that said, Zoom meetings and internet worship have become essential. And yes, they are the way that we have kept connected and still do. It's a wonderful thing. And yet they are facsimiles of what can be until we can look one another in the eye once again. We experience our best and healthiest lives when we are intimately connected with one another face to face. Paul expresses this longing when he cannot be with the people he loves in the flesh. The claim that we all share in the gospel is a key story for Christian life, especially when so much Christian culture seems to focus on individual salvation alone. The good news of Jesus, our experience of God's love and grace, is not just an individual possession but a communal reality that God is enacting all the time and in which we are always invited to participate. Instead of focusing on individuals, Paul calls attention to the community, all the saints who together as a community share in the gospel. 
And this means sharing alike in the joys and in the sufferings of our common life on behalf of God's love for the world. We experience such signs of hope in our own community. Yesterday, we dedicated the 420th Habitat for Humanity home built in Indian River County. Our Habitat mission, which we support here as a church, is to provide an affordable and secure home for working families who live in Indian River County. But Habitat for Humanity is about much more than individual home ownership. It takes an entire village of volunteers from area agencies and churches like our own, those owners whose homes are completed and those who are currently under construction, the sweat equity hours of homeowners and their families and friends, all build that home together through countless volunteer hours. This creates joy and the vitality of community. We need one another in just such a way as this in order to survive and thrive. I'll conclude this morning with a story that illustrates the strength that comes from our Christ-centered bond of community commitment. It's a story, of all things, about fish. You'll have to tell Drew this story when you get home today. It turns out what we can, that we can learn a good deal about the power of togetherness through the genius of the gold saddle goatfish. Doesn't that just roll off your tongue? The gold saddle go goatfish is a small fish native to the Hawaiian reefs with a distinct coloring. In the past few years, divers in Hawaii have come across a fascinating phenomenon. During their regular dives, they begun to notice a very large fish with the same brilliant colors as the gold saddle goatfish. Yet upon closer inspection, the divers realized this wasn't one large fish, but in fact a school of goat saddlefish swimming together in such impressive unity and in such perfect fish-shaped pattern as to appear like one imposingly large fish not to be trifled with. It turns out when the gold saddle fish feels threatened, they join together, unified in fish formation to appear, appear much larger. Though Paul didn't know about it then, the gold saddle goatfish provides an important lesson as we face significant threats that are tearing us apart. Do we turn inward when we face struggle, trusting only ourselves? Or do we huddle up with our neighbors, our friends, in our church to face the oncoming storm, be it a global pandemic or something greater still that we have not yet seen? We can see now where the gospel of Christ, as modeled by Paul, is going with this, can't we? The church united as one body in Christ, despite any differences in personal opinion, offers our deeply divided nation our best hope for a full healing and reconciliation. We've grown to prefer to be with people whose opinions and worldview we share, and we've increasingly come to disdain those who have other points of view. The gospel invites us to resist this temptation at all costs, lest it cost us everything. Beloved in Christ, who are in Vero Beach and on the Treasure Coast, who are scattered up north or out west around our nation, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from that very first day until now. May it be so, and may all God's people proclaim, Amen.